And if not for the marketplaces, I think there's a lot of success in brands launching their own small websites, at least as a way to capture like a direct relationship with a customer. The, the relationship between a seller and a brand and a customer on marketplaces is still pretty bad. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high-level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce brain trust. I'm Julie Spear, one of your co-hosts, and I'm joined today by another of our co-hosts, Noelle Barnes. Hey, Noelle. Hi, Julie. Welcome back. Thank you. We have another podcast today where Noelle and I get to take a listen to an interview that Kiri recently did with Joe from Marketplace Pulse. And during the course of the interview, Kiri and Joe dig into a lot of meaty topics relative to Amazon, the opportunities that are presented in terms of international markets, as well as platforms on seller versus vendor. And they also dig into eBay. It's You don't often hear eBay in the course of the e-commerce conversation, but it does play a role in today's conversation. It does. And it's interesting too. It definitely is. My ears perked up. (laughs) (laughs) So we will give a listen to Kiri and Joe's conversation. And then Noelle and I will be back after their conversation to just pull apart some of the key takeaways from their interview today. Yeah, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Joe at the Catalyst 2018 convention from Channel Advisor recently in San Diego, which I think he mentions he's on his way to soon. Yes. Yeah. He's interesting. He's an entrepreneur who built MarketplacePulse.com, which you mentioned. And they're they're really interesting. They're a data gathering company, which focuses on e-commerce marketplaces all around the world. And they try to use that data to help identify trends. And they use the data predictively to see what's coming in next and how marketplaces are growing and changing. And I love data. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm a former Amazonian. I love data. And this is a really interesting behind the scenes space, helping educate brands and sellers with the data that they're pulling from all these different marketplaces. And then they use that data also to build articles for their content. They have this great blog that people can go to and read. It's a great resource for our listeners. I'd encourage you guys to go check that out. For example, they can see how many sellers are using Seller Fulfilled Prime. And they can plot trends over time to build insights about that, about the program's usage and what that might mean to to both the seller community and to the broader e-commerce ecosystem. So there's some really interesting data collection and analysis happening over at Marketplace Pulse. So cool stuff. Yeah, they do. Their blog is very, very interesting. I enjoy reading articles where they dig into categories, specific categories Mm -hmm. and measure year over year growth, both in general retail, but also as related to Amazon. So It is a great resource, and we definitely do encourage our listeners to go check them out. Well, let's give a pause here, and we'll move into Kiri's interview with Joe from Marketplace Pulse. So on the podcast today, I have Jesus Kazakinas. Is that how I say your name? I'll take it. I'll take it. (laughs) Also, who goes by the name Joe and Joe is the founder of Marketplace Pulse, which is a really great resource that I tune into at least once a week. And you also provide services to retailers and and brands, essentially covering the marketplace opportunity, not only Amazon, but Walmart, Jet, uh, eBay, all of the marketplaces and provide a lot of useful data to retailers and brands who are looking at that opportunity. So I thought there would be no one better to come on the podcast today and talk a little bit about international marketplaces, of which Amazon is active in quite a few at this point in time. So welcome to the podcast, Joe. Hey, what's happening? (laughs) So maybe after I've given my summary of what I think Marketplace Pulse does, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and and what how you describe Marketplace Pulse to the world? Of course. I've been working in e-commerce for probably the last 10 years. I think, I think actually exactly 10 years ago, we launched a books e-commerce website in Lithuania of all the places as my first first startup. And then since then, I've been 
focus both on the technology and the data side of retail. And over time, that has kind of pulled me closer to marketplaces because as you probably have realized by now, in most countries, marketplaces lead the online retail space. A couple of years ago, we built one of the largest Amazon retail businesses, one of the largest Amazon seller companies. Uh, and then since then, I kind of moved on and started working on Marketplace Pulse, which is primarily a data company. So we spend 100% of our effort into collecting data. That starts at APIs and ends at financial records of these companies. So we ingest as much data as we can about as many things as we can, like things like sellers, brands, products, their earning reports, their social media presence, all sorts of different things, and ideally as much of it as possible. And then we use that data to inform decisions. So our our primary focus is working with companies who can utilize this data for their own decision-making, which now that now that is mostly companies behind the scenes. So we don't actually work with brands or sellers directly. We only work with companies powering marketplaces or companies who offer additional services to people who sell on marketplaces. So we're, we're, mm-hmm. we have become one of these behind the scenes companies. Like right. if, if you, if, if as a seller or a brand, you receive, for example, you've received a, a loan from one of the, uh, from one of the services. They probably utilize some of our data, but at the same mm-hmm. time, at the same time as we're kind of working behind the scenes in what is kind of like a not a very exciting space, we we see a lot of potential to utilize the data we have to educate brands and sellers and everyone interested in the space what we think is happening. Like personally, I think there's a lot of misinformation and kind of subjective opinions in retail. Everyone wants to talk about the future and what's going to happen, but they just guesses. And we try to find data that we can imp- interpret it and, and kind of find an explanation for what is happening. And that's what, right. I, think, that's what I think our, our blog, which focuses on, on a very kind of niche audience, has become pretty, pretty successful to a degree because we, we try to write about things which most people can't because they don't have the data. So since we do have a lot of data, we try to focus on using the data for content. So for all the brands and retailers, I think we have a lot of interesting insights just from a content side. And over time, we hope to get to the point where we can also offer some some tools or services for brands and sellers to use directly. But at, at the moment, we primarily work with companies behind the scenes okay. who can utilize our data for something big. So what I'm reading about on your blog, which is... Great, and everyone should check it out, marketplacepulse.com. That's kind of the byproduct of your core business, which is more at the corporate level, giving retailers and, and much larger corporations insights. Exactly, exactly. So, for, all, for, for example, for a lot of the data we have, we have an endless amount of dashboards and charts and graphs and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of look at that once in a while and we see, oh, like this chart started to change. What does that mean? For example, like how many sellers are using uh, are utilizing fulfillment by Amazon? We plot it as a chart, and then once in a while we check the chart and see if something has changed. And if it has changed, maybe we can investigate deeper into this and see maybe something else has happened. And that kind of informs informs some content piece. So usually we start with, hey, let's collect as much data as about as many things as possible. And over time, there's a chance that that data will provide insight. So some of the things we have written about have been kind of in the works for over a year or two years, but then it takes a really long time for, for, for certain things to become possible. For example, one of the, like, one of the best examples of that last year, we wrote that, uh, I think, I think hundred, a hundred thousand sellers join Amazon marketplaces every month, which is both a fascinating number, but also it's something we wrote about we can actually, because we can actually count those sellers and pretty accurately, I think. But it's not something we can just do it on day one. So like it, it took us, it took us a while. It took us two years to, to build the base data size and then like be able to kind of update it frequently enough so we can actually kind of measure that with a certain kind of, with a certain validity to our insight. Like one, like we are not, obviously we're not, a, we're not Wall Street Journal. So we're not, we don't have a huge, we don't have a huge journalistic team, but to a certain degree, I think we try to follow these kind of core journalistic principles where we try to be pretty clear about how we get to our insights and, and what these insights are based on. And we try to make them as reliable as possible. 
So you have all this data at your fingertips. And the reason why I wanted to bring you on the podcast is to talk about the opportunities that sellers and vendors who sell wholesale direct to Amazon have with both international marketplaces and other marketplaces. So the the listeners to this show are are generally sellers or vendors who sell on Amazon.com and are looking for ways to expand their revenue. And one of the services that we offer at Bobsled Marketing is to help those brands launch in international marketplaces. But the challenge is, well, that it's easier said than done. There's a lot of tax and compliance boxes to check. There is a lot of logistical boxes to check around log- you know, logistics and transport and who's going to do your repackaging. So there, by the time we give a client or a prospective client a list of things to do before we can help them on Amazon in the UK or Europe or Australia, that, you know, begins to lose its its sparkle because there's just so much stuff to do. So since you track all of this data in aggregate around how many sellers are launching on the different international marketplaces, what could you tell us about where the trends are and maybe like a little bit about the methodology and why tracking the number of sellers is interesting in those marketplaces? Sure. We don't just track sellers. We also look at brands which I think also provides a, an interesting point of view when it, when it comes to growth of marketplaces. Hmm. For Amazon, for Amazon, 70% of their sales come from US. The other third comes from all the international marketplaces. I think Germany, Japan, and United Kingdom are the three largest international marketplaces. Anything else is, is obviously much smaller. But when it comes to selling internationally, like my, my fundamental question to a lot of brands would be like, what are you going to do to sell? Like one of the core things we found is, especially about Amazon US is that there is a million brands on Amazon and that number keeps increasing. Uh, there is a, a thousand sellers joining Amazon US every day. That number keeps increasing, which means while a decade ago, you could just list a product on Amazon and it would just sell organically. That doesn't work anymore. So when it comes to selling internationally, like what are you going to do on these international platforms to make your sales happen? In most cases, that means the obvious things, of course, like the creating of listings, translation, correct pricing. But reali- yeah, I'm, of course, advertising. But realistically, you have to figure out the fulfillment part of it and the advertising part of it, which are both costs. Like you have to pay money for this. So for, for all the smaller brands, it might be co- kind of prohibitive to launch internationally because they have to split their inventory and store it internationally and also invest into advertising in, in multiple countries to have any chance of selling. So I would say instead of being in a point of view where let's try to sell in as many places as possible, because that kind of makes sense in theory, I would say try to sell in as little places as possible while still achieving that, like growth, like selling selling on on multiple marketplaces shouldn't be a goal by itself. It should have a goal of like, hey, we have to grow our sales by X percent, or maybe we want to increase the value of our company. Maybe we want to sell it as a, as an exit. Then, like all of a sudden, the goals change. But ultimately, if you want to achieve X percent of growth, like where that growth is going to happen and at what cost. If you can spend the advertising budget and fulfillment budget and product budget on growing the Amazon US, maybe that's better than spending that budget and diluting that budget on the international marketplaces. But because like it's often that if you sell internationally and if you don't commit fully, then nothing happens. Then you're doing this kind of half in, half out experiment where you're maybe selling some of the products in some of the marketplaces internationally, but your prices are very high. You're not doing anything for the lo- lo- localization of the products. You're not spending money, any money on advertising. And, and then obviously it's not going to work, but nothing is, nothing is going to just sell because it's listed on the marketplace. So even though Amazon is not only huge in the US and they're huge internationally, like these are macro numbers, like they're the hundreds of billions of dollars we sell every year. These are macro numbers, which for most brands are irrelevant because how are they going to take a percent of that is very different for a different brand. And that's why ultimately, I think my question to any brand is like, what are you going to do to sell? Like, of course, they can u- utilize your services for Bobsled marketing and 
and do great, but like, can we afford these services? Can they afford the time it's going to take? And ultimately, what is their strategy? Like this whole this whole question of like where you're going to sell and what countries you're going to sell is pretty complex, and I think it depends on a lot of different metrics. Like what exactly are you trying to achieve? Like are you trying to grow sales? Are you trying to grow reach as an international company? Are you trying to grow profit? Like which what is the goal? And that kind of decides which of its marketplaces will work really easily. I think I'll, for all the brands like. Obviously, selling on Amazon internationally simplifies the process a lot because if they sell on Amazon in the US already, they can, um, they can get international markets much more easier because they understand the interface, they understand the process, they understand how to optimize it. But there's obviously much more to it. Fulfillment being a key part of it, advertising becoming also a very key part of it. So what about um, the inter- so that's the international piece, which is something that is, it's kind of sexy, like the idea of going to, new marketplaces and some a lot of these brands get inquiries from customers in those markets so they want to they they believe that there's demand there already so what about other national marketplaces like ebay and jet.com and walmart.com do you have the same perspective there that is are people better off focusing on on amazon if they're an established brand or is it worthwhile looking at these smaller marketplaces what does the data tell you so I don't think there is a one fits all solution for this. There's obviously a lot of people who, a lot of companies who've been who've been very successful in selling in multiple places. But at the same time, there are plenty of brands who've been successful at selling just in one place. I think in the in the US, eBay and Walmart are the kind of a second choice most brands should probably make. The question for me would be: Does your product work well in these marketplaces? I think. Especially eBay has a slightly different customer base. At least the shopping patterns might be different. People might be searching for different things. So the fact that a product is successful on Amazon doesn't mean much. They still have to be successful on eBay uh, on their own merit. I think the challenge for a lot of brands would be figuring out fulfillment for all these different marketplaces. The market in the US, from a consumer point of view, has gotten extremely used to very fast two-day shipping. So of like allowing that on other marketplaces is pretty hard. I mean, there are inter- uh, external services who will help you with that, but there's no FBA for uh, eBay. There's no FBA for Walmart, but customers expect that. So that's kind of a challenge for brand. I think in terms of like, in terms of reach, obviously eBay has the most, uh, probably followed by Walmart. Jet seems to be becoming very focused on, on the high income customer base. So it's, it, if the brand works with that, then Jet probably is a great place. All of these marketplaces like Jet and Walmart are not as saturated compared to Amazon, which means uh, any product has more visibility than they would ever have on, on Amazon. That, that presents an opportunity. So while they are smaller in their own right, they have a bigger, they have less products on a marketplace. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a similar like micro versus uh, versus small metrics is like there is one thing which is the size of a marketplace but then there's a second thing is like how much potential as a, a single brand has and on a smaller marketplace a, a, a brand might have just as much potential as, as on amazon because amazon has so many more brands and especially walmart has been very deliberate in limiting how many sellers they allow and limiting how many brands they allow which is which means if walmart thinks your brand can work really well in walmart there's probably going to be way less competition as you would have on Amazon. That's a great point because I've just been doing my weekly news recap today and there's it, it's popping up more and more this issue with counterfeit sellers that Amazon has. And so the more it gets into the press, the more Amazon will actually be pressured to, to do something definitive and take care of brands who have persistent counterfeit or unauthorized seller problems. And that's one big difference that I see between Amazon and a Walmart, which Walmart has strict vetting requirements and they want to limit the number of sellers on their marketplace to ensure quality. Whereas Amazon, at least from the outside looking in, kind of will take anyone with a pulse. And then if if something goes wrong with a customer experience, they'll just suspend that seller immediately. So they have kind of a shoot first, ask questions later approach just because they let so many sellers onto their platform that's been what caused a lot of benefit issues yeah i think you're 100 percent correct like it's i don't know what's the plan in terms of what amazon is heading towards 
But in terms of our catalog, it just has no limits to it. So anyone can list anything and anyone does do list everything. Like for most product, not for most products now, if you search for it, you will have a couple dozen fake brands who have private labeled that product from, from China and, and are selling it now, plus all the counterfeit issues. So it's becoming noisy to the point where all the brands feel very uncomf- uh, uncomfortable selling their products on Amazon. But unfortunately for all the brands, the, the sheer size of Amazon means that they still need to think of Amazon. Like they still need to probably either sell it there or think of another strategy. So yeah, I think over the next decade, like consumers will have to figure out how much do they care about this counterfeit issue and Amazon will have to figure out like how much are we going to try to stop it? Like the counterfeit issue is much bigger than Amazon. Like it's, it's a massive problem for every, all retail. But on marketplaces, it's extremely easy to execute because you can just list anything from anywhere and it just sells. So, yeah, it's kind of a challenge. As of now, Amazon does not have any major limits to who can join on Amazon or any limits who can create a product on Amazon catalog, which means it's just wild, wild west. And and we'll see where it leads to. I've heard that a lot of brands are kind of worried about what that means for them because if they list their product in between these millions and millions of of poor looking listings like how does that influence their own brand value but i think that's just that's that's something people are that's something brands and people are still trying to figure out is like like how do you manage amazon where anyone can create anything yeah so is there any sort of um high level data you can tell us about where brands are moving to like if if they're already on amazon where do they seem to have the growth potential as seen by what other marketplaces they're launching on it's it looks like if it works for a brand walmart is doing really well it also looks like if if it's a more of a commodity product ebay still works really well Hmm. I haven't shopped on eBay in years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is I'd never think of, I never never crosses my mind as somewhere to buy things anymore. Yeah, I'm always surprised that I'm always surprised just how much they managed to still sell. Like eBay has been stag- stagnating for so long, and yet somehow there's people on it all the time. So it's pretty fascinating to think. But I think eBay as a company is trying to reinvent themselves and make themselves like fit for the future. So I think one of the, one of the funny things we looked at is how many times does eBay talk about brands and they haven't talked about brands ever. And then starting like a year or two years ago, they started talking about brands all the time. Um, so their eBay is also realizing that. So, I mean, we'll see what happens, but like eBay is, is a, I think it's in a tricky situation of having to retransition their business from being an auctions website to something brands can actually use and build their growth. And if not for the marketplaces, I think there's a lot of success in in brands launching their own small websites, at least as a way to capture like a direct relationship with a customer. Um, the the relationship uh, between a seller and a brand and a and a customer on marketplaces is still pretty bad. So brands have no way to talk to their customers. That's why it's still worth the effort to have a Shopify store or something like that where. If you drive some traffic to it, you can at least build some resemblance of an email list, which becomes a pretty valuable asset down the road. But ultimately, in terms of sales, a lot of it still ends up happening on Amazon. Right. And so is that something that you're, you're seeing in the data as well as the number of vendors who sell wholesale to Amazon may be declining based on the proportion of Amazon's retail sales versus marketplace sales? I don't have any any number on it, but surprisingly, the sales of what first party on Amazon are increasing hmm. as opposed to marketplace. Really? Yeah, it's it's counterintuitive to what I would think Amazon should be doing. Yeah. But in terms of volume of sales, uh, in terms of dollars, um, it does appear that the first party business for them is as big as it ever was. Right. Yeah, which like a lot of brands still feel very comfortable selling to Amazon and don't have to worry about dealing with marketplaces, right. which I think kind of directly explains the business you're in. Like a lot, like while technically anyone can sell on a marketplace like Amazon, 
a lot of brands are ultimately in a wholesale business and they're just yeah. unfit or unprepared or like unwilling to deal with selling in retail. Yeah. And that's why Amazon still captures a lot of business. That's why you capture a lot of business. So like the relationship between Amazon and brands is still a thing being figured out. Mm. And like, I think when it comes to really big brands, they probably still feel much more comfortable selling to Amazon, even though that does mean that the listing quality Amazon has is much worse than if they did manage it themselves. Right. Like Amazon ultimately doesn't care about brands enough. Like they, like they physically can't, they physically can't have enough people to manage all the products for all the brands they have. So they do the, the least amount of effort for all of them, which if you're a brand, you should probably think about it. That's really interesting because like, we see a lot of vendors who come to us because they don't get these vendor managers at Amazon. They get loaded up with client accounts to work with and they're, they're managing dozens, if not like 70 different brands. And so they can't possibly, they don't possibly have the time to really educate or be a, uh, be a resource for any of those brands that are selling direct to Amazon. And so a lot of those vendors get so frustrated because they don't understand the system. They don't understand how they're being charged. They don't understand how to optimize their products and the so- product assortment so that it sells better. And they end up having to pay for, for help in one way or another because the resources that Amazon have given them are not adequate. But at the same time, from what you're you're saying, they're making as much money as ever from their retail division as from the market, not as from the marketplace, but you said that the, the retail sales right, are still right. increasing. So I think like a big part of this is that um, this over time has created this massive opportunity for smaller brands, for private label, for what we call Amazon native brands yeah. to sell. Because in a lot of categories where the leading products are sold by Amazon directly. Amazon is obviously not doing the 100% of a good of a job they could be doing, which means there's a gap in the market, both in terms of pricing or in terms of advertising. Like Amazon is not going to be advertising as effectively or as, as good as it's possible if it was a brand doing it themselves. That's why you see all these small brands launching on Amazon and absolutely killing it in terms of sales because they care about the products and thus they optimize everything and, and they do advertising much better and they invest into growing their sales. Like it almost circles back to my my first part is like, what are you going to do to sell? Like if you're selling to Amazon, you're doing nothing to sell. You just hope Amazon will do something to sell your products. And they do some of it. Like they do, they're not, I'm not saying they do, they do nothing. Of course we do some something, but like they do the least amount of possible work. But if you're a brand and you realize that Amazon is not, is not, it's not a random website, it potentially can be half of your sales or even more of your sales. And you should probably invest more into it and like own it more than just like offloading it to Amazon as a first party. If only to manage your own listings and if only to like, take care of them in a way which both speaks your brand message. And like, of course, a lot of brands are probably scared of it. It's like, they're like, I don't understand retail, I don't understand Amazon. That's why they should probably talk to you or companies like yours, because like they had, like a lot of, I mean, a lot of the wholesale companies are just not built to deal with retail. They're not built to selling products to customers. Their cash flow cycles and their pipelines for inventory are not built for that. But I think there's a, like there's a transition period they can make, and ultimately be able to deal with Amazon in a in a in a way which allows them to control it ultimately, much better than than selling to Amazon. So to wrap up here, because we've been we've gone on for our allotted time, but what would you like to share with our audience today about Marketplace Pulse and the services that you offer, or any events that you're attending that you want to to call out? I will be at Shop Talk in Vegas next week, I guess mid-March, and I will be at Catalyst by Channel Advisor at, in April. I think I'm speaking at Catalyst about the future of brands on Amazon, which I think is a very interesting conversation. And if people are interested in what's happening in marketplaces, I think they would have a very interesting time following our blog. We try to look at a lot of interesting metrics and we try to raise questions of what, what do these metrics mean for the small guy. So when, if Amazon is getting a million new sellers every year, how does that influence a single seller? Mm. So we look at a lot of interesting metrics. We look at a lot of interesting facts we can get 
and we try to drive insight from it. So for for people and companies who who kind of want to think more deeply about their operations and 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 get us a, a kind of a different perspective on a lot of points we, from a source which I would say is very unbiased. Mm. <laughs> then they should probably uh, read our read our blog. Yeah, it's a great blog. I recommend it. Marketplacepulse.com. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast again, Joe. I will see you at Catalyst in San Diego. And thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks. You have a great day. Bye. So big thanks to Joe from Marketplace Pulse for taking the time to do that interview with Kiri. So Julie, one of the things that I took away from that interview was his key question there, which is what are you going to sell? And it's it's really important these days to know your product, to know your audience, but also to know which marketplaces you're going to approach. And I think both on Amazon and other marketplaces, you know, he, he talks about the international piece of this and that there are so many brands on Amazon, which is very different from 10 years ago when you could just pretty much list a product and start selling. But internationally now, you have to think about listing, translating, having the right pricing, advertising, but that, you know, now fulfillment and advertising are really the keys. And that for smaller brands, it really might be prohibitive to have to sell internationally because there's so many costs associated with that. Advertising is expensive. And so for smaller brands, rather than going broad, you might have to be more selective about where you sell and really focusing on an area or set of marketplaces to achieve that growth rather than spreading yourself too thin. And how he says Amazon is really good at selling internationally because they try to make this easier for, for brands to do this through Seller Central and, and, and for those brands that have the, the vendor central relationship. But yeah, I could see how marketplaces internationally, other types of marketplaces would be much harder to sell on. Fulfillment piece alone would be hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think that question of what are you going to sell and then digging into the costs associated with selling those items, that that's definitely something that stood out to me as a theme for Mm -hmm. him throughout the conversation, but also the question of what exactly you're going to do to drive those sales. It's not a matter of just list it and and let the magic take hold, but giving thought to the strategy around what you're going to do to drive those sales and the cost of that strategy. So it's a targeted approach with a clear eye on the cost of sales as well. Yeah, you have to work at it. And I think that that dovetails nicely into a conversation he has later in the interview about Seller Central versus Vendor Central. And that, you know, surprisingly, first party or Vendor Central sales on Amazon are increasing relative to third party in dollars. And that's partly because it's just a lot easier for brands to go wholesale and not have to deal with that retail part. And so brands just stay in that that 1P relationship, even though that relationship has risks, right? They might tarnish the brand because Amazon doesn't really have enough people to physically manage all those brands very well. Both because of, you know, they might tarnish the brand because of pricing or other issues. But third party can do very well if they really care about their brand enough to get the fundamentals right. And so that retail relationship with Amazon can be really beneficial, but you have to manage it and you have to know it really well. And it goes back to that initial question of what are you going to sell and how are you going to do it? It takes a lot of work. The age old question. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. And then the other thing I thought was interesting too is when he talks about non Amazon opportunities. So other marketplaces like Walmart, eBay, and Jet, it's really not a one-size-fits-all approach and that plenty of brands can be successful in one place. But but the, these these retailers, these marketplaces are the second choice for most brands and probably should be after Amazon. And so you have to ask yourself, which one is the right place for your brand? And can you fulfill on all of these marketplaces? Because logistics get pretty hairy after a while. So that's a, that's a really interesting part of the interview as well. Yeah, I liked his take on Walmart as an opportunity. And and the point being that Walmart has such controls in place about who they allow to sell on their e-commerce platform, that if they are going to allow your brand to sell, that's an indicator that there's an opportunity there because they are trying to limit the number of brands and have it be a more selective platform than the anyone is welcome approach of Amazon. So I thought that was an interesting take on how their process of selection could also be a good indicator of the level of opportunity for brands. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Big thanks to Joe. Yeah. Big thanks to Joe and to Kiri and to you as well, Noel. Thanks for Thank you. joining us for another week of the e-commerce brain trust. And we invite everyone to come back and join us again next week. 